Game day on the Real Kipper and Bourne show. We are live on Sportsnet 590, the fan, Sportsnet 360, and Sportsnet Plus from 4 to 6. And remember, you can get to Real Kipper and Bourne at any time you like. If you can't catch us live, wherever you get your pod. Yeah. In Texas, if you want, 590-590. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Derek Brandeo, David Sisboom Baugh. And in for Sammy McKee, Disco Dan Franceschi. The organized, the all-knowing, <laughs> the very helpful at Disco Dan. How are you, Yele? Oh, guys, I am doing well. It's great to be back. Good it's been a while. It's great to be back. <laughs> so when when did we have you on last? Because that, by all my estimations on you on Twitter, changed your life. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. We'll say we'll go with that. It was a great experience. I think that was that was in the middle of January. At middle some of point. January. Middle of January at some point. Yeah. So since then, what's life been like? Because wow. you made your national debut. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what commercials? No, no. I I, I wish personal I personal appearances. Kipper, I wish I had the Mercedes one like you. That's a pretty <laughs> sweet gig. I gotta say, it's a pretty sweet deal you got going on there. Uh, no, nothing's changed. I still show up for work like normal. Uh, I maybe gained 10 Twitter followers, which is fantastic. Okay. Nice. And, and I'm right. happy. That's great. That's all. all. Right. We're, we're good. And, and it's been, yeah, it was very cool, obviously, at the time. Uh, pretty surreal. Uh, fun to be back with you guys. And the Disco Dan moniker just it took, took off. off all man. right. Well, took baby off. steps to the Mercedes. That's coming, <laughs> it's coming next. So, Disco, obviously another uh, welcomed opportunity because, I hate to say it, but our Sammy faked an illness oh. to watch the first <laughs> round of the Masters. It even occurred to me that it's the first day of Masters. Oh, written all over it. Wow, what I a saw read. This, I saw this more than, like, people saw the eclipse coming. Bet365 <laughs> had this at minus 150, I think. At, he was uh, not showing up for work. He even set the stage, didn't he? He did. He gave it, you know what he did? He did this one yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Here's where I think I'm it's genuine. Well. He will never pass up an opportunity to go play golf. And he had that yesterday. Yeah. And he didn't go golfing. He so I do golfing. think it's somewhat genuine. I really he, do. No, no, no. You can't go golfing and then not show up for work the next day. <laughs> well, or he That's just bailed lame. on one group and went with a group that agreed to keep it quiet. I don't know. Mm. Lame. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. We should have come in with the tinkly music today. We should have some azaleas. We should be yeah. whisperish, be hush tones today yeah. for the yeah. Masters. Uh, Nick Kiprios with his lineup trying to find his pen for the 13th time. I'm good now. Okay. It's a little different. Uh, listen, I, I told you this. I, I'm not used to having an itinerary so organized. There's a lot um, of information. It's a ton of information. And, you know, Sammy's lineup's gotten a little better, but it ain't this. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Listen, I know you don't have to tell me, okay? Uh, but we miss him, Sammy. Hope we, we feel do. better, He'll pal. be back. He'll be back soon. Yeah. All right, game day here. We're inching ever so closer to the Stanley Cup playoffs, but there's still four on the table for the Toronto Maple Leafs, including one tonight against the New Jersey Devils. Yep, going to have some lineup changes, sounds like. Uh, particularly on the back end, Ilya Labushkin going to draw back in. Uh, Joel Edmondson been out for eight games, uh, had blocked a shot. His foot was hurting him. Yeah. He'll be back as well. Um, McCabe out, resting some injuries. And who else would be out there? Lilligren's still sidelined. Lilligren's still out. And then up front, it was Dewar for Noah Gregor. Dewar that was Gregor. the other change. So uh, starting to see some rest for some guys who aren't hurt, but could just use a little bit of time. All right, we'll pick up on that with our sh first uh, Sheldon's Sheldon Keefe's uh, Kipper's Clipper on the load management and what it means to sit McCabe out tonight. I mean, case-by-case case situation, I, we don't have it. At this point, I wouldn't say we have anybody in, the, in that same sort of situation. Like, you know, like I said, Kipper's, he's played a lot and done a lot for us this season. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know that he's played many games at 100%. Like, he's, he's played through a lot of stuff. Uh, this season, nothing that's obviously held him back from playing, but he's, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's played through a lot. So, uh, you know, give him in particular a chance to, to breathe. I think is is good. I think the rest of our group right now is feeling is feeling good for those that are in the lineup. You know, McCabe's interesting. He's missed eight games, uh, or sorry, this season. He's yeah, he's missed eight games. He's still pretty good numbers. Eight goals, twenty assists, plus nineteen, playing twenty one minutes a night. Thereabouts. He's been a big part of their back end. And he's going to have to play a really big part 
in the playoffs here. Mm -hmm. He's a guy that I, I like for sure. I'm just not sure where he truly lies in terms of is he a legit top four defenseman? I can't believe you still wonder if he's a top four defenseman. Well, on the Toronto Maple Leafs, he is. Okay. I just don't know on a what we perceive as a Stanley mm -hmm. Cup contending blue line. Yeah. And, like, I, I just measure the Vegas You're basically, Knights. you're putting I them look, up against Colorado, Vegas. Exactly, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I know Vegas is kind of struggling a little bit here, and, you know, we'll get into that oh, probably yeah. later on in the show as they – they took a really bad loss against the Edmonton Oilers, and we'll get on that uh, probably bigger picture in, in the next hour or so. But my, my point in all of this is if if McCabe was on Vegas's blue line, which we know is a Stanley Cup blue line, yeah, where would he look? Where would he would he, can he be a top yeah. four on that blue line? <clears throat> you know, so maybe you know they're about to me. It's like. Vegas is the best decor that we've seen win a cup recently, right? It was Petrangelo, Theodore, Hag, and White Cloud were the third pair. Um, forget who I'm missing. Um, uh, Hag, did you mention Hag? I did. You McNabb. Did Hague. McNabb. You know, like they they, yeah. they were really really good. Yeah. You know, McCabe to me is no doubt about it is a good second pair guy. You know, the Leafs aren't going to have the, I, no, no, the best I, D. I know. The I, we we know that. Yeah, yeah. But it it, it may be their Achilles heel when it's all said and done. Yeah. And Matthews still is Matthews. Yep. And Samsonov's pretty good still. Yeah. It may come to that blue line where we go ultimately yeah. they weren't deep enough or they weren't – they were missing yeah. like a, a a legit 2-3. Yeah, I think the, re the question you're posing, which is a good one, is is he what they want him to be or need him to be? You know, like, he's definitely a second-pair guy. He's definitely going to play shutdown minutes. Yes, he's definitely going to be the the guy yes. out there against the best lines. Is he going to excel in those minutes? He has at times this year, but it's, yeah, definitely a question mark. He's not, yeah, he's not one of the elite. Okay, let's go to Sheldon Keefe on Edmondson coming back into the lineup and also uh, Connor Dewar. Yeah, it's great to see him back for sure, especially for a guy that's still new to our team. You know, to for, have to have him missing time, you know, it's tough. So, uh, yeah, to get him back in the mix is good. He's, he's you know, he's been uh, managing this well, and he's been back on skates for a while, but just giving him time to, you know, be certain that, that things are good. Uh, it would be nice to get him back in and, you know, get him those reps that, that uh, he needs and that we need to have with him. And I guess the other, the other lineup changes do are going back in in that same sort of situation, just continuing to give him the reps here as a guy that's new to our group. Edmondson had a comment today. He said, um, it's never fun to watch hockey. If it was playoffs, I would have played right through it. It wasn't that big of an injury. We just want to make sure it was 100% before getting back. Yeah. Eight games, a lot to miss for a help a thing get better that Depending you can play through. Depending on who you it? talk to, a deep bruise or a slight crack, crack or something. Yeah. You yeah. know, can, can you play with a hairline fracture yeah yeah right that right. sort of thing yeah okay you don't want to you don't need you don't to. Want to yeah is it 70 percent? is it 65 percent? i hope it's a, a bone bruise that would be better than a hairline fracture those things they can heal though yeah right they can and i think that's what happened yeah. if it was then he should be fine two three weeks is a big difference yeah he's been skating for two weeks it is it was interesting to me just because he is a guy that it's a small sample of him in that lineup, and you want to kind of figure out where he slots in best. Yeah. Right? And that even maybe goes hand-in-hand hand with, like, Jake McCabe. Like, who's he going to play with? Mm -hmm. And how does that sort of – how do you assemble your top four on the blue line to ensure you feel comfortable about that group going in? So, yeah, missing – I think missing eight games is a big deal. And he said, even adding to your comment there, Borny, reading the quote, mm -hmm. talked about how he's been skating for, for two weeks now. Yeah. Like, he, he felt good and felt ready to go – and very, today, very cautious, very cautious before even Keith was like, yeah, he's going to be back in. He declared himself healthy and ready to play. Yeah. He was ready to go and eager to get back in there. How do you like Riley Labushkin, Edmondson? I see Brody. I see Riley Labushkin as uh, your, your, your pair, mm -hmm. first pair. Anything Morgan's on has to be your first pair. Yeah. So that's your first pair game one. Benoit McCabe, Edmondson Brody. 
Tough to look at. I know you, you did Lilligren. I know you like Where Lilligren. is Lilligren? We expect him to play two games, just one. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you? It's tough. Now you're into that territory of, I'm not sure there's going to be enough to, to, to lock in Lilligren in, yeah. a, in game one. It's like, I know even if you want him in, if he hasn't been playing, it's really tough to say, okay, go yes. defend yeah. Bennett and Kachuk and, and that, whoever else. That includes that we think TJ Brody is now coming back, I right? The last two games have been good. Been, been okay for me. Yeah. You know, is okay good enough? That's right. So is it yeah. is, is, is okay to better yeah. good enough for you to pick him over Lilligren? And how important yeah. is it that you need a second right handed shot in your lineup? Like yeah. right now, mm -hmm. you're going in tonight, you got one right handed shot in Labushkin, and he's a uh, he's Labushkin. He sure is. <laughs> the best Le I can describe him. He's Labushkin. <laughs> he's, right? <laughs> I, you know, speaking of the blue line, I guess the one question I have there is then, well, I think everybody would naturally point and say it's Benoit that is really the bubble guy and th that yeah. if Lilligren's in, he's the one coming out. Brody's probably done himself some favors with how he's played recently, but I kind of feel like it's actually closer than what it might appear. This is Kip. This like, is like, Kip's been beating that drum. How can you take... I, I just I find it difficult. How can you take a guy like Benoit out? Like what he gives you, what he provides. Yeah. There's something about the way he plays. I think we're past that now. There, I, he's in. He's in. He's in. like there's something about the way he plays that strikes me as a guy for one whatever reason. Yeah. We always look year over year. Yeah. That third pairing yeah. deemed on a really good playoff team, and you say, oh that guy, and sure enough, he's productive and. 20 minutes and 14 him, seconds per game this period this uh, month. So they're they're, they're playing. They're playing. They trust. Yeah. So I don't know where they stand on feeling like Lilligren as a right-handed shot still gives you more flexibility mm -hmm. on, on the back end, right? That's important too. It is. So one thing I think we should talk about, because it's the talk everywhere I go about the Leafs is Matthews and 70, mm -hmm. which I know it's, you know, you and I maybe are less inspired by that than I think fans of the team think it's a huge deal. It's it's a large, you know, going for this chase. I wrote an article yesterday on um, should he rest or should they let him pursue 70? Yeah. I want to get your thoughts on that. We do have a, a Keith clip on it as well. You can decide if you want to go first or Sheldon goes first, but. Uh, let's go to Sheldon. Okay. We'll go to Sheldon and then we'll pick it up because uh, I, I also wrote an article today for the Toronto Star. God, a um, couple of authors. Yeah, a couple of authors going at it. Um, <laughs> and I. I had my thoughts on on Matthews and and the best season by far in his career so far. So Flip. let's go to Sheldon first. Flip four. Am I concerned about it? Not necessarily. I think the guys have done a good job of it. You know, it's been it's been good. Like I look at the goals that uh, that group has scored and that Austin scored. The process has been good. The guys haven't cheated the game. They haven't forced anything. You know, um, any of that sort of stuff. I know I've got lots of play on. On, uh, you know, whether Austin should have been on the ice with the goalie out and such. And he was going to be out. He's the next man up. He's, he's not going to be out there four on six. It's not a situation that he would, he plays in. And that, to me, is forcing it. To me, the guys are just going out there and playing. That's the best way. If you want to add to your goal total, just go out and play. Those are good players, and they've been dominating play. Just go out and uh, go about it the right way. But it's, I mean, it's pretty remarkable already what Austin's accomplished here, right? The number continues to grow, but... Um, you know, nobody in the league has, has has gotten to this number, and that in itself is pretty terrific to watch. So, you know, um, Austin's feeling really good right now. He's got lots of energy. He's playing with lots, uh, you know, he's playing with a free mind, and you can see it out there. So we'll just, uh, you know, keep going about it. And, and uh, you know, within our team process, he's a big part of it, and he's going to score goals uh, through that. It's kind of what I've been preaching all along here is that it's just the look of the record right now. And I, I think it looks absolutely perfect in terms of what it should look like. And they're not chasing it. He's not chasing it. The team's not chasing it. I was so happy that the, it was an, an obvious look that there's an empty net and I want this guy to go out and in stuff when he in there. Play in. Good on Sheldon Keefe to go, no, that the rotation's the rotation. He wasn't next man up, and I'm not giving him a freebie and, and throwing anything else off. Yeah. And that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. So 
to get to your question on what's right or what's wrong, I don't. I, there's no definitive answer. Yeah. I know a week from now, if he gets hurt, they're going to take it from every which way. Oh, yeah. But that goes with anybody. Yeah. There's no hindsight here. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you, do you, do you take it? On, upon yourself as a yeah. coach or general manager, and do you go in now and tell Austin you're not playing? You're not playing. So I have weighed this carefully. I think in my mind about what's best for him and the team. I think there's a couple of questions that are important to answer first. Do you think that the rest gained by not playing will make a material difference in his performance in that first series? Like, will sitting out, let's say he misses the last two games of the year against Florida and Tampa Bay, is the gain tangible? Will he actually be 1% better if he doesn't play those games? I think probably 1% is reasonable. Like, you know, some somewhat better, right? It's tough to say, right? We don't have an answer to that. You're, at the end of the day, you are guesstimating. Exactly. Well, that's yeah. generous. I think I'm just guessing. <laughs> There's, there's, there's no way to know. There's no way to know. And so all the sports science doctors and whatever, doctors, but sort the, the people, the people who make these calls yeah. will say the rest will help him. Playoffs are a long run. The rest is good for him. Let's just assume they're right. Let's take that at face value that the rest will help him in playoffs. Then I think if he only has 67 goals or 68 goals with two games to go, and the rest will help him in playoffs, I think you have to prioritize the team. This is a team that will come to be defined by putting personal above team based on contracts and, and now something like this if they don't win. And so even if they don't win the cup this year, it reflects better on the player to sit out and rest and try to maximize his performance in playoffs over chasing this goal. So I get why they might rest him. I actually think it probably makes more sense to rest him. Everyone I've talked to disagrees and says, boo that and chase the record and 70's awesome. But what are we doing here? What is the priority? And to me, it, if, unless he has 69 goals, no, 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 it's no. a statement. You're either in or out. Not, not, you got to make that same decision whether he's got 67 no, or 68. No. 69 changes that. It does. Now you're not prioritizing the team first based on what you just told me. Well, now I think he is. Well, here's the thing. If you go in with 67, even if you, you're not even likely to get the record if you play. 68. Have you watched this guy lately? He can <laughs> score three in a period. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you're going to. But it, he could. But if he has 69 and he's going to get the record, almost certainly then I think it changes the math a little bit about whether you do it or not. You hate to play him. God, Kip, he's got 68 goals. You play him, and he gets hurt or even tweak something. Yeah, like I told you. Then he's it's... getting buried. The no, Leafs no, no. are getting yeah, buried. Yeah, the Leafs will get buried for sure. And I'm burying you for not saying that he should should have sat out. Yeah, but he can get hurt in practice. Like, it's could. I don't know. He could. He could. In... But I'm more likely to get hurt climbing no, Everest no. than to sleeping. 100%. So I, I, climb I, I, I get that. I'm with you, though, Borny. I do agree. I, I think you have to prioritize team over individual. I, I firmly believe that because at the end of the day, as you put it, they're going to be judged based on what happens two weeks from now and beyond potentially, not what happens come next, what is it, Wednesday? Mm -hmm. They finish the regular season and whatever that goal total is. He hits 70 and they lose in the first round. What, what our conversation that? is not any different. It's not going to change. It's going to be a repeat, rinse and repeat of what we've talked about for years now when it comes to the playoff failures and the shortcomings. And, and gosh, I mean, God forbid he goes out and he has a bad first round. We're not going to look at the 70 and say, well, but he scored 70. No, you're going to say, well, he went buried. five games and scored one goal. Yes. That's what counts. So it will all be forgotten very quickly, regardless. It'll, it'll be a passing conversation and then it'll be gone. I'm with you. Like I, I, I've always been in that camp the whole way through. What did you rest them? What did you think of Edmonton not trusting Connor against Vegas last night? Well, Connor's hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, you buy that? No, I don't. But he, is so he? They, yeah, they're and he's they're and he's one assist. He needs they're, they're saving one more they're for hundred. Him. But he's not. He's yeah. chasing an MVP. He's yeah, chasing an yeah. Art Ross title. Yeah, they didn't play him last night. It's a good point.
I mean, I think some people would say that 70 is different. They may than whatever Connor's chasing and a heart trophy, which he already has, you know, Matthews has never hit 70, but I get your point that they're probably resting their best player for the first round. So I, I think this is a minority opinion that I think you should rest Matthews unless he has like 69. He can take it out of our hands tonight. It's the Devils. Yeah. No offense to the Devils, but he scored 16 times in 17 (laughs) games. Yeah, he has 16 (laughs) goals in 17 games against the Devils. He usually scores, and he probably will tonight. How about this, though? If he has no goals tonight and doesn't score against Detroit on whatever that is, Saturday, Mm -hmm. then you definitely rest him, right? 66 goals, two games left. You Definitely rest him there. I think if you're Keith, you probably just want him one way or the other to take the decision out of your hands. Go yes. out there tonight, Saturday, again. score two goals, give me a couple, get there, say, okay, we can. And even if you want to play the card of, well, there are still stakes because like home ice is still technically available to them. I don't think it matters. But may, he's probably sitting there being like, gosh, please do something so that I don't have to get the questions about you sitting at 68 or 69. And is he going to play or is he going to sit? It's going to be, it's coming to a head. All right, let's pick up on that uh, topic with Sheldon Keefe, clip four on the concerns. Oh, of, we, just, we did that. Oh, did oh, we, we do did that, that already? Yeah. Did oh, that. I'm sorry. No, all good. All right. Um, one last thing yeah. on this. Like, for me still, I, my first priority would actually be giving Tavares a night off here. Come this on. is, well said. This, is uh, and this is a key guy jamming. here. He's going to play second hold to Matthews at the center ice position. This is the guy I got to make sure has legs. Much more concerned on Tavares playing every other night, heavy minutes against a Florida Panthers team and providing offense and still providing that responsibility defensively. Like, if they if they shut down Austin here, if Barkov has some success, where is it left after behind him? That Tavares, to me, is a an important guy to shut down here. Yeah, you know, there's a case to be made that Austin might be better off playing games, staying in the rhythm, scoring goals. Tavares right now hasn't scored in five straight games, has a couple assists over that time. Yeah, maybe he doesn't quite have the pop he had a couple weeks ago. I think that's a great point. You know, this is... And then so the question becomes then is how much do you prioritize this home ice advantage chase in terms of should you just rest all these guys, not worry about home, you're not getting caught by Tampa Bay at this point, you know, or should you just sit Tavares, sit Matthews, sit, I don't know if you want to get Mitch back in a rhythm a little bit more. Mitch is well rested. Mitch is well rested. Morgan is well rested. (laughs) Yeah. No concerns there. There's times when Willie plays and he's well rested. (laughs) Willie, yeah. You get what you I'm get. Fine you with don't Willie. get upset with Willie. No. Just, yeah, yeah. No. You're right. He plays. So just just the guys I think that uh that we mentioned. Uh one guy that doesn't appear to need any rest is Max Domi. Let's get Sheldon's thoughts on uh on where his uh importance may be down yeah. the stretch here. Clip three. Clip Please. three. Or not. I mean, he's always been a guy that has that ability to make plays, but I think just as he's progressed through the season and gotten more comfortable here and uh, more comfortable with his line mates and obviously the way it's going now with Austin, it's, it's, uh, it's been terrific to watch, but you know, we've used him a lot in the middle of the ice at center and he's done really well for us there. Uh, so, yeah, he's got, he's got that ability. So it's, it's ability, it's skill, and then it's confidence. He's a veteran in the league, and, uh, you know, he believes he can make a difference, and, and that confidence is something that shines through for me in any moment. This is a guy, he's a competitor that the opposition can bring whatever they want. He's still, he's, his confidence doesn't get shaken by anything the opposition is doing, and, you know, uh, and I've talked about this with Bert. I think it's those types of competitors and that mindset, I think, is, is you know, what was exciting about adding those guys in the off season. And as this season is winding down and you're getting more prepared for playoffs, you're that much more excited because I think those are the types of guys that, that will shine when uh, things get uh, most difficult. Foregone conclusion, Max Domi's beside Austin Matthews for game one. 
I don't think foregone conclusion, but certainly trending in that direction. Right now, uh, Bertuzzi has 13 points over his last 13 games, including nine goals, all at even strength. Um, Domi, 13 points over his last 15 games, plus 13 over that time. I mean, it certainly looks that way. Are you coming around to that at all? Yeah, I am coming around a little bit. Yeah. I am. Uh, Bertuzzi's going well right now. If you were to bring in Marner on that line, which ultimately I think at some point yeah. we're going to see a push You're from the going Leafs. To see You're going to load up. You're going to have They're Matthews behind and Marner in the game and they'll be there. back there. But so far, Bertuzzi's feeling really good. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. And Willie will continue to be with Holmberg and maybe Robertson tonight. What's he? How many points does he have? Like, speaking of milestones here, what yeah. does he have to go to 100 still? He was Willie on pace four. for 128, 130 yeah. uh, a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. two months ago. This guy was on pace for 125. I think he has two points in his last six games. He's he's one to watch tonight, Chase, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So four games left, he needs four points. He's averaging 1.2 points per game or a little bit more. So you'd think he'd get it, but, boy, he's been, been kind of stuck lately. We'll see. Uh, Just need a couple in the on the power play here. Yeah, three points in his last nine games. Three and yeah, okay. three in his last nine. Wow. One goal during that, that span. Real drop off for him. Maybe he does need a night off, Kip. <laughs> but does he really? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm with you, Kip. I, I, when I watch him, sometimes I'm just I shake my head. Yeah. Just because of we, we, we all know we all know, but. You need him. You desperately need him. These fans have come around to Willie. People ain't get mad at him anymore. He just is Willie now. Th that's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. I think I think there's still enough time for these lines to kind of feel each other out and gain more chemistry. But overall, I got a much better feel for this lineup going into the playoffs than I have in, in previous ones. Really? Yeah, I do. I think I, I get a better vibe from one to four yeah. than I ever have in the last little while. And that includes... <laughs> You know, those significant trades last year, Ryan O'Reilly. Yeah. Like, they didn't have a Ryan O'Reilly trade this year, but it feels like it was almost forced last year. Mm -hmm. Ryan O'Reilly's a great player. He's won the Conn Smythe. He's led a Stanley Cup team. Fit him in there, and let's make some magic. Totally. And it didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't happen, and I, I get a feel like guys know where their roles are this time around. Yeah. Better? Does that make sense uh, to you? Totally. And, and you know what? This is the first year of the last three or so where the Leafs haven't looked to new players to say maybe they'll fix the problems. Like, the growth from this forward group has come internally. McMahon became a waiver, went from a waiver guy yeah. to a, a contract guy. Benoit, same thing. Like, Holmberg, regular in the lineup now. Yeah. The growth is internal. There seems to be a hierarchy, which is something you've preached to me over the, the last couple of years. Yes. You know where do where do guys fit in and are they okay with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's. I would say we are mutually optimistic about this Leafs team right now. Which when though, that's not and, and you know whether <laughs> whether it's Ryan Reeves in or out. Yeah. Uh, and there's he won't play tonight. Connor Dewar's in with Camp and Nyes. Nyes, I think. Mm -hmm. Like whether they're playing eight or nine minutes, they look. Nyes is coming. They, yeah. No, they yeah, look like. Like they're playing 12 or 14 minutes because yeah. when they're out there, mm -hmm. there's significant four checks. There's yeah. significant uh, cycles. There's, there's positive there's, plays. There's, there's significant place to the net. Yeah. And th there's a sense now that, that that fourth line is key now for the mm -hmm. Toronto Maple Leafs. Which is crazy considering, you know, years past looking at, okay, it's going to be Spezza and Achari and, you know, like trying to piece it together. So, um, yeah. Hey, man. That was a lot of positive Leaf stuff. That right there, what Kipper said about the fourth line, it harkens back to, I mean, two, three years ago, years of them playing Tampa, and it always felt like the fourth line was on the ice. That Perry, Nick Paul, those guys, yeah. it always yeah. felt like Maroon, they were, Maroon, yeah, Belmar. Maroon. It's like, did they always. play 28 minutes? It's like and then you look and they're minutes. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. yeah. But they made an impact. They put yeah. their, they had their fingerprints all over the game at all times. And I think, yeah, that fourth line, this Leafs fourth line has... Sort of showed a little bit of that as of late. For sure. Uh, is our Sammy McKee, who's home covering the Masters for us today, yeah. uh, tweeted anything on uh, on Tiger, his start? 
should check out Sam's Twitter account to see how active he is today. I'll keep you abreast of that after the break. How about that? Can I also mention that you got me in this pool? Yes. Right? And it's a good pool. <laughs> good pool. With Shout out Brandon Miller. 271 entries. Yeah. Wow. And just prior to the show, I looked and I was in 271st <laughs> place. <laughs> I'm not even... Uh, uh, last. Xander Shoffley is last. not helping either of us. I have Shoffley too, so... And I was I, I was so upset, <laughs> I didn't even look where you are. Yeah, probably T271, pal. That's not possible, but anyway. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Joshua Cloak, Maple Leaf writer for The Athletic, will join us. We've had him on a couple times. Solid writer. Very good. Stay tuned. More Real Kipper and Born after the break. The Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Disco Dan, Talking Leafs. Go to Joshua Cloak, Maple Leaf writer with The Athletic. Tell us about Tiger Woods. Is he ready? One under through one. He's on the on-deck circle, He's on pace to shoot 72 below. Under? 72 under. Does does he make the cut? Yes. Has he... He's literally never missed it, right? He's made the Masters cut every year of his career. He ain't ain't missing now, pal. When was the last time he, he, he was in last year? Yeah. And he made the cut last year. He did. Yeah. He just didn't play the weekend. You hurt, right? He got, he, yeah, he withdrew in the third round. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's what I remember. Yeah. I, the, yeah, it's, can he play 72 holes of golf is, is a tougher question than will he play well enough? We gotta, <laughs> we gotta find, we gotta do a show from there. I think they'd let us do from our Augusta. show from there. From Augusta. <laughs> Real Kipper and Born. Yes. <laughs> from Amen Cor- Corner. Yes. Sounds amazing. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. As promised, Joshua Cloak joins us now. Josh, what's going on? Somewhere in Burlington on a go train heading eastbound. Uh, kind of wondering what the point of these last three or four <laughs> days in the regular season is. That's kind of where I'm at. Really? Staring out the window. Yeah. Existential well, crisis over here. Oh, listen. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, once upon a time, you know, the last five or ten games of the NHL season included, like, legitimate playoff races. Now, it's load management. <laughs> right? How exciting is that? Talking about load management. Uh, it's probably not very exciting if you're Austin Matthews. Right? Like, I, I'm sure that conversation is going to happen. It's probably going to happen, like, awkwardly over the next few days. Um, but it's tricky, right? Like, the Leafs are still fighting for, like, home ice advantage. Um, and there's some fans that I'm sure would rather they start on the road, given their road playoff record under Sheldon Keith. But, I, man, it is it is going to be tricky. I'm thinking about that conversation and how, like, Austin Matthews is essentially going to say, no, I want 70 goals. I want to play. And then if you're Sheldon Keith, like, what are you really supposed to say if the best player in franchise history says, I want to play, and you're kind of thinking, oh, but we, we want you to play better in the playoffs. You like, say tough beans. I don't know. Like, what do you, like, you know, Keith, what, what, how does that conversation go? Do you think if, and it's funny because we, we do talk about load management here, but it's with uh, Jake McCabe tonight. That's the conversation. But really, should we be focused on, Matthews, Marner, Tavares, or Nylander here. And if you're gonna if you're gonna pick one, does it need to be Matthews first or last? Or like where's Tavares in all of this for for making sure that he has fresh legs for game one? Yeah, great question. So if we're doing a power rankings of these like four players and who should get load management, uh number one on who should not get load management right now is William Nylander. Like, you got to get him going. you got to get him producing. Um, and maybe the key to that is getting him, you know, more ice time or on, the like, the second line. Um, I think he's kind of, even though I like the idea of balancing out, um, you know, your scores and having three lines that can score, it does kind of feel like he's in no man's land right now. So I think you, you probably don't rest him at all. And the same goes for Mitch Marner, right? Coming off injury, you want him playing. But, Tavares is an interesting one because I do like the idea of him becoming this kind of shutdown center or this matchup center. 
Um, but he's also the oldest, so you'd think he'd need some rest. Um, and then you land on Matthews. So I, I don't know. I guess where I'm at is, like, don't don't rest William Nylander or Mitch Marner. You need William Nylander. He's been, like, just on average, he's been their best forward in the playoffs over these last few years. You need him going as best as he can. So I don't see him resting at all. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I don't I don't think Mitch will rest. What do you got, Kevin? Oh, I'm just, I, I'm just worried that you missed your... St- your stop. You okay? Listen, I'm going to stay on as long as I have to with you guys. I, but uh, I, I, I'll go to Oshawa. For <laughs> Love hearing that, Josh. Appreciate it. The, uh, you know, the, the one that has me curious is, and you can clarify this, it seems like they have all but named Samsonov the game one starter. Oh, yeah. What do you think the plan is here? Three starts in a row, like you're going to want Joe Wall to play is Martin Jones going to start? What do you think the goaltending rotation looks like down the stretch here? I think you probably see Joseph Wall on Saturday. Uh, and again, I'm, so, I, I'm sorry to undersell this, but in a meaningless game. Uh, and then you probably see Samsonov uh, against Florida on Tuesday in a bit of a playoff kind of preview. And then you see Joe Wall on Wednesday. So you get Samsonov a little bit of rest there. But you want Elias Samsonov continuing to roll with this kind of mental strength that he seems to develop. Like, I, I really like everything about his game and his attitude right now. You know, he was the team's Masterton nominee, and he didn't want to talk about November and December at all when he was asked about, the, you know, the kind of hurdles he overcame. He didn't want to talk about that at all. He only wanted to focus on the future. We're seeing, I don't, not a meaner, but like just a, a hardened, Elias Samsonov, and, and I think that that's good. But no, like he he's the starter, game one, no doubt. Um, does that rule out Joseph Wall in game three or four? Because as, as much as he is the starter, like does, does anybody certainly feel like you know he he's going to play all seven games? I don't think so. There's always this threat of injury looming, and there's always this threat of you know, what happened in November and December kind of just looming. So he's the starter, no question. He'll get two of these next four games. Um, but I, 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 and I think Joseph Ball knows that too, right? We're talking to Joshua Cloak, Maple Leaf writer for The Athletics. So I'm going to uh, ask both of you guys this, but I'm, I want to get your comments on this. I, I'm, I'm really surprised that since Joseph Wall has been back, that this didn't turn into more of a, you know, split on who should start because now it's almost as if because Joseph Wall hasn't found his game since returning and it's maybe a stretch to say he can do something that will convince us otherwise with just four games to go, there's a real sense that as far as the goaltending is concerned for the Toronto Maple Leafs to start the playoffs. Man, all their eggs are in one Samsonov basket right now. Yeah, yeah I, go ahead, I, Josh. I, I want to hear from you, but like, uh, you know what sticks out to me is how when Joseph Wall came back, Sheldon Keith gave him two starts back to back against Boston. Like, and that was tough. He let in four goals in each. Not, you know, not all of them were on him, but that was a really tough start like in terms of coming back from injury, you know, that was just a tough hand to be dealt. And I, I like, I like the idea, you know, you throw your potential starter into the fire and see what happens, but he's just never really gotten his game back on track after those two games in Boston. And like, I, there's no question about his like mental capabilities to me. I just think that really put him behind the eight ball a little bit. I don't know, Borny, where are you at? Well, you know, it's not like he hadn't hasn't played any good games. You know, he he gets a he loses to Carolina with a 9.53 save percentage. He beats Washington with a 9.58. He had a couple decent games, and then he's been an 8.40 and a 900 and a loss and a win since. He's not been terrible. If I would have had money halfway through the season, I I would have picked Joseph Wall to start in the playoffs. Yeah, and I think that's how they saw it too, which is why it's kind of like. It's amazing how they pivoted fairly quickly to, okay, he's going to be the backup. You know, 
they definitely need to play him. Like they, he very well me may, may be an important piece of this yet. So I kind of think it, like maybe they go Sammy again Saturday, Joseph Wool on the 16th, and then Jones the last game. You know, give Sam Samsonov almost a week between starts for, for to, to get ready. But I don't know. It, it is going to be curious, and I think it's boor- I don't want to say it's unfair, but. I, once those Boston games happened, they just sort of put him in the back burner and said, you're not the guy anymore, which is weird because yeah. they put him in that spot. You know what, what I think, too, is like, and, and this is, uh, the, there's maybe too much psychology involved in this one, but I always thought that it would be best to have Sam Snob as your starter to give, like in, in game one, to give him that confidence, right? Because then you know if things go sideways, Joseph Wall is a really good backup option. But if you start with Joseph Wall, yeah. that's, that's, that's kind of tough on Samsonov. You've, you've really backed him into a corner. He loses a lot of confidence that way, and then you don't know what you're getting if you have to turn him in game three. That's the way I've always thought about how they're going to approach, you know, goal coming in the playoffs. I don't know if that one makes sense to you guys, but that, that's where I'm at with it. Got to ask you, uh, Joshua, about the blue line and, you know, all things being equal and everybody's healthy here we can all safely say that we think Mark Giordano will be on the outside looking in, but who is who's beside him watching on the blue line in game one? Yeah, that's a great question. I would think it's Connor Timmins, and I just I think I think Timothy Lilligren gets in. Um, and you can hear the, the the how hesitant my my tone of voice is. Like I think he gets in because the Leafs just need some offense from the blue line. They need some, and, and I just don't think Connor Timmons has really solidified himself as a really good PP option as well. Right? Like, I think people want him to be the guy, but it just still feels like a development project there, and um, I think you, you need someone like Timothy Lilligren who can break through lines in the neutral zone and, and move the puck cleanly. Like, yeah, you're, you're understanding that there's going to be some defensive miscues with that um but i just i think they have to find a way to get him in there because i don't think they've found another good power play option uh obviously besides morgan riley but so that's why i think timmons is probably out timothy lilligren is in hopefully he can get a few games in um and he's probably your bottom pairing guy and and i think they're gonna really lean on him on pp too do you have benoit and edmondson in I have Edmonton in and Benoit out, which I understand okay. is sacrilege because, like, Simone Benoit has become a cult hero. He likes milk. In Toronto. <laughs> he likes milk, <laughs> uh, which is strange to me as an adult to, to think about <laughs> another adult drinking milk. But, um, look, I I just – he he brings a lot, and I think there is a, a future where he played in the playoffs next season. But they just, they have, on that blue line, if you look at that blue line right now, they have other Simone Benoit types. Mm -hmm. And I just think you need something a little bit different because they've really struggled all season. If you just look at, like, the season as a whole, they've struggled to create offense in the blue line. And I don't think you're getting it from Simone Benoit. The Leafs would have to run into an absolute brick wall here to not finish second or third in their division. So they're getting Florida. I mean, I don't even think we've talked about it significantly enough on this show. Like, the draw is the Florida Panthers. How do you feel about how that shook out? It could have been Boston. It could have been the Rangers. It could have been a whole host of teams. How do you feel about it being the team that eliminated them last year? I feel like, I mean, they were going to be underdogs no matter who they would play. I frankly feel a bit nervous because, like, I'm packing for the trip, the, the, the final regular season trip to Florida. And I'm like, am I going to end up staying here for like a week and a half? Yeah. Am I, you know, it's, uh, but that's a conversation, a, a testy conversation that I'm going to have with my life, wife in a few days. <laughs> uh, we'll go through that later. But look, I, I, I think you like the, the challenge. And I think you like, if you believe, being the underdogs. I mean, frankly, they've been better on the road in the playoffs under Sheldon Keith. So you probably like starting it on the road. Um, you know, I think it's very likely that the Leafs, if they do end up matching Florida, they just stay in Florida for those two days, you know, between the end of the regular season and the playoffs. That's good for the team, you know, team bonding and getting together and being away from, 
you know, all the extra cameras that show up come playoff time. I think that's, that's good for the team. Um, you, you were going to face a team that eliminated you in some way, no matter what. Um, but I, I don't know. I think if, if you're the Leafs, you feel, yeah, you, you feel better about being the underdog. I mean, when was the last time they entered a playoff series as the underdog? Gosh, Washington? I don't know. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. it has. Yeah, exactly. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good shift for them, right? I think you, I, I, I think you look at the new makeup of this team. You know, the Bertuzzi's, the, 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 the Domi's, these guys that, that are starting to bring a little more of that, you know, P and V that, that they, this, this management group wanted them to bring. And you like going on, you know, into a, an away barn and, and, and you like kind of being the underdogs. I, I think it's going to be important for them. And I think it's going to be important to kind of lean into that, that mentality a little bit more. Joshua, great stuff, man. Really appreciate your time. You never miss a stop on this show, that's for sure. Oh, you've been sitting on that one for a few minutes. That's great. Buddy, I'm, I'm, I'm this close to being a professional host. I think you might be now. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wait until Union Station before. <laughs> All right. Enjoy the game tonight. Thanks, Cloak. Joshua Cloak, Maple Leaf writer, yeah. The Athletic. It. So... Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna spend all next week. You know that. Yeah, I guess that's why we have versus dug in. the Florida Panthers. We're gonna do. We should do like a pre scout show where we go through it like I would a a, a real team pre scout. So like Florida's limping in here. Yeah, they've had a couple good games. Right, they had a good game against Ottawa. So yeah, so count you count that. Yeah, I think, sarcastic. Uh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. They, I'm they counting beat Ottawa, anything right they now. They beat Ottawa. Two of their last three games by a combined score of eight nothing, so that's what I mean by they're doing better. Where do you have still home ice advantage for the Leafs up for grabs here? So I don't 50, have 50? the stat exactly in front of me, but I I feel like at home they're like five and thirteen, and on the road they're eight and five or something like that. You got it, Yelly? I, I got the last three seasons. I knew you. Okay, at home the last three years in the playoffs four eight and two. The on the road. Seven one and two. No, they're not. I swear. Seven, Seven one, one and two, and two in the, the last road. three playoffs so, on the road. You know that's just that makes no sense. <laughs> but like pressure is a very real thing, right? I mean, you know that better than anyone. And John Cooper, and I'm gonna say this tonight on the broadcast with you sitting beside you on the desk, has taken great pains to paint the Leafs as the favorite in previous series. Oh, we'll be lucky to get games off them. The Leafs are the best. We're just, you know, everyone's picking them. Listen. Right, listen. Because <laughs> to put the pressure on the Leafs, right? And at yeah. home, there's more pressure. But I do think it's overthinking it a, a bit to be like, we don't want home ice advantage. Like, they should be experienced enough to know what to expect from that pressure now, no? I'm with you. Okay. It, make, it makes total sense to me. Yeah. And either you believe that you can win or you can't. And you don't care where it is. 100%. It's like, it's yeah, attitude, okay, there's baby. pressure at home, but you've been through the pressure. It's your eight of these playoff runs. Handle it, baby. All right, the march continues towards the Stanley Cup playoffs. First, for the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Devils tonight, 7 p.m., Sportsnet Ontario. JB and I will be on that panel with Elliot Friedman, who will join us in the next hour. Plenty to talk about league-wide, including those Coyotes. How? That's pretty good. <laughs> Is it over? Oh, Finally. Mercy. Uncle. <laughs> that more when we continue. Unreal Kipper and Bourne. All right, let's kick it up. It's the national edition of the Real Kipper and Bourne show. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Disco Dan Franceschi in for the master, Masters Watcher, Sammy McKee. He's got the Masters flu. Any update? Do we know what's going on? Oh, he's got IV bags, I've heard. <laughs> Don't he's... forget Sammy. Oh, Sammy, the Masters. <laughs> I want, yes, oh. the Masters, like Tiger. Yeah, uh, Tiger was one Tiger under par through cut. one. He is uh, one under par through three still. Right. Shambo seven under. Seven under. Is he done? He's done now. Uh, yeah. What a round. I know. And I didn't pick him. I think he'll blow up. He's Do you? Good. Yeah, Good. Corey Connors inside the top ten. Two under. Let's go, boys. Two under. Canadian, two go. under. There we go. Here we go. Plenty to get into. We're going to be joined momentarily by Elliot Friedman. Talking 
the league right now, the Coyotes, Utah, will get up to speed on that. Hannafin signs a brand new contract. What is with that? Nine million Vegas. per. What do you get? Seven two seven three five. It was seven. God, that's a bargain. Seven three five Times over eight. eight. We've got uh, Sochi NHLPA poll out where Sid dominates in probably the best category of them all. Being good, so we'll get hockey. into that. In the meantime, I wanted to ask you guys uh, during commercial break if if you remember. Maybe you weren't born, but I did a Hockey Central at Noon show with Doug McLean and Darren Millard, and, oh, the, and the roof caved in. Oh, Pardon me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, the roof fell. Okay. Yeah. And I only bring this up because as I sit here with my notes and, and my computer, I noticed this, this screw in this washer, <laughs> and I don't know where they're from, but yeah. like every once in a while, if you, look, if you find me looking up at the ceiling, yeah. just... Give me a heads up if, if something <laughs> drops, okay? Okay, hopefully that's the last of it. Reminds me, like, when I was in 11th grade math, I brought a screwdriver, and I would take one screw from the room every day. So by the end of the year, oh the room my. was just in shambles. Really enjoyable. Uh, wow. We're going to get into Elliot, of course, with uh, the Coyotes news. But uh, let's go to you first, JB. And just, you know, it, it for me, it's like nothing, 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 and then hair on fire. Yeah, I know. Unbelievable turn. Hold on. Before I answer that, because I'm going to answer that, we also forgot to mention O.J. Simpson passed away. That's okay. good news. All right. Would you like to comment on it, or is uh, it no. political? No, I got no comment. No comment. Let's preserve the integrity where, where, where of O.J. Do you, where do you think we're going with that conversation? <laughs> There's nothing right? good that's going to come from that. Yeah, so right? a lot of jokes. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the Arizona thing. That yes. was left field. Absolute left field. Like, ah, yeah, no, they're they're going to bid in this auction. We're doing everything we can. Years of just down the road, down the road. <gasps> oh, they're going to move in nine days. And do you think it's like, like you don't hear this from 10 insiders and then have it be like, oh, it's not happening. They're actually going to stay in Arizona. They gone. They're gone. It's just, uh, for, for me, it's like, we all know the way the league conducts their business when it comes to what the fans know, what the media knows. They're strictly on a, you need to uh, know. Yeah. And you, right now you don't need to know, right? That's the way they conduct their business. For sure. Right. But it does make you skeptical of everything they say. So what happened in the last week here that went from, yeah, we're looking to uh, see ya yeah. gone. You tell me what did happen. Like, is it basically been they've just been this is the plan all along, and now yeah. it's happening in a week, and so now yeah. we have to find out because people have to kind of know now. Was right? it the mayor of Scottsdale that shut that potential site down, and it was it like, help. well, we're out of sand, yeah, in the I, desert. I, I think, <laughs> which is tough to do. I think that might have been part of it, but not really to me. Like, I just think they couldn't, they didn't want to say anything until they knew they had as many pieces in place as possible. And it really is at the point where if they're going to move a week from today, people have to be notified. Plans have to be made. So now it's starting to come out that this is real. See, Are there coyotes they, 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 in Salt Lake City? People have to move. <laughs> like, Find that, that out for that, me, will you? The LA? That is the least of their worries when it comes to... What, letting people know is the least well, of the who, 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 who needs to know? I don't know. Like the secretary needs to know if she has to move her whole family to a different state? Like I said, or, you're on a need-to-know basis, and right now you don't need to know. Borny coyotes are common in Utah. <laughs> are they going to just be the Salt Lake City Yotes? I don't know. What I don't if know. they? I don't know. Do you think they made some level of assurance to, and forgive me, I don't remember the coyotes owner, his name. Alex Marullo. Alex Marullo. Marullo. Did they make... You think there's assurances there that, hey, first kick of the can, we're going to do this, but don't worry, you'll get your franchise back. It just will be as an expansion team. Like, let's go away well, for a you, little why, bit. Why would you need, why would you do that? Why? Unless, unless something was in part of the deal that the owner had something on the NHL for, for maybe pushing you out well I, I don't like was there and we'll ask elliot but yeah there there is some belief that alex had some sort of he had something over the nhl where he could sue them maybe yeah well that's yep. right yeah, that does seem relevant like you can't 
the owners own the team and presumably like Donald Sterling in the NBA did something that they deemed egregious and unacceptable conduct and you, you got to sell your team. You know, he got a bunch of money for that. I guess if, can it not be similar here where the league says you can't provide us a place to play? So like, how do you sue the league when they say you just, you can't have a team here if you can't put well, us in an NHL ring. So uh, the belief is that this is, this is a you're selling the team, right? But you're but forcing them to sell it. You are for yeah, you are, and there's um, relocation fees, and there's right. So who who sets that up, right? Who who decides what that fee would be? Like what? Usually, you sell something to somebody. You give me the money, I yeah. give you this. Yeah. But that's not the way it works in the NHL because there's the league going. Okay, what's in it for me? The league does that league mean the other owners? Yes, the the other owners somehow are are prof, profiting from this. Yeah, right. So there, you assume it's in a relocation fee because you just mm -hmm. can't pick up and sell your team. You need a, a a board of approval by the other owners saying yes, you can move your team there. So, like Forbes estimates of the value of the Arizona Coyotes, I don't remember offhand. Totally guessing, like six hundred million or something like that, yeah. like a low number. But so, the, the feeling is, is, is hopefully Elliot uh, will join us soon and, and verify it. He'll be on. Uh, $1 billion. So the league gives Marulo a billion for his 600 No, oh, no. Oh. Ryan Smith in Ooh. Utah gives uh, Morello $1 billion. Okay. And then with that, he gets to pay off his debt, mm -hmm. which could be in the vicinity of $1 billion. Oh. $300 million. Okay. And I don't know what he's in for, three hundred million yeah. maybe to begin with. Could end up profiting three or four hundred million out of the deal. That's you know? nice. That's nice. So yeah, tough to sue, sue speaking, someone who makes you three hundred million. Speaking of getting away with murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, aren't you glad I brought it up? You got to land that <laughs> tremendous joke. I was, um, I was the question I I thought of, and I thought about this a long time. And yesterday I was on. In the evening and i pose this question i just what is the fascination with arizona it's general? the size of the market is that is that is it it's simple the fifth as that just television market in the united states i am in more belief than ever it's a fantastic market mm. you arizona. believe it's a fantastic one i said it's a big one i don't know yeah no i think it's fantastic i think it could be a home run what's for the changed league. your mind on this that it's a great sports town okay and the one fault in 20 plus years is just you never found the right owner. No. And you never found the right facility. Buddy, they started in an NBA building without hockey sight lines. And they ended in a goofy minor college rink. How do you do that then? How do you take a give a franchise to a place that can't doesn't have a facility? I guess they thought Glendale was coming and they didn't anticipate Eventually, the location it, it's up it's up to an ownership group to to build so, one. So, yeah. And I and, guess that's what Glendale and, was. And they never did. And Glendale, they got for free. And they, it was uh, like Buddy, I pulling there. teeth to get people to go there. I lived there and I was a hockey fan. And I went to three games in three years. Because it was an hour and 20 minute drive through Phoenix at rush hour. It, it was a, It's a bad experience. That, that location that they, they just listed that yeah. was going to go on auction yeah. and still will. Is a home run. Nice piece of land. It's gorgeous. It's yeah. between Phoenix and Scottsdale, yeah. downtown Phoenix, and 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 ten minutes from Scottsdale. I have no doubt in my mind if they built it, it would have been spectacular. All right, all right. Let's welcome in Elliot Friedman to uh, add to this story in terms of uh, Elliot. Uh, we we're just speaking moments ago how it felt like for twenty years we've been talking about this market and needing oh, to yeah. leave and not leaving, and then in a blink of an eye. Everybody's got them going to Utah. So maybe just give us what you know or the latest or, you know, what's still out there to, to, to truly dive into. Well, Nick, uh, I, I, think, I think that they are working hard to get something done. Um, there's no guarantees. Um, there's a lot of egos involved and there's a lot of lawyers involved. And that can be a bad and volatile combination. <clears throat> but... Um, they're definitely working at it, and there's a will to do it and a want to do it. And I, I think there is definitely, I, I don't know if framework is the right word, but I'm going to use it. I think there is a framework of a deal there 
that everybody is prepared to do. You just have to paper it and get it done. Now, I, I think this, you know, the I was in Vancouver last night. The Coyotes played. They didn't say anything. Uh, they were really, like, basically they told the media, none of these guys are going to talk about it. And But the, the sense I really got just from being around them, uh, Nick, is that there was a lot of shock. I don't think they believed that this was going to happen this quickly. I think I really got the sense that they really, that they thought that they were going to go to the auction and see what came out of it. And over the last couple of weeks, um, I think two things came up. Number one was they weren't, what happens if they don't win it? And number two is even if they do win it, uh, they weren't going to be there until the fall of 2027 at the earliest. And they didn't want that anymore. There was a lot of pressure from the Players Association. There was a lot of pressure from other owners. Eventually, you reach a point where you have to concede this doesn't work. And I don't know if it's going to happen, Nick, but I do think that they want to get it done for next week because I think they want to... I, I think that they want to meet with the players while they're still there. You know, when a season ends, guys, as you know, you stay for a couple of days, you have a team party, and then everybody kind of goes off in their own way. And I think they want to do it while most of the team is still around. So, Elliot, what does this mean for the city of Phoenix and hockey? in the future and how about for salt lake city and hockey like this is a permanent fix they're going to stay i guess where are they going to play can you give us the answer on the two cities relationship to their new teams or no teams sure justin um you know right now they're going to play in the delta center which is where the jazz play i think they have to do a bit of uh retrofitting there for hockey to do some work however Basically, they're getting a new arena. Um, the, the bid process now for the Olympics is a little different than it used to be. They give you preferred bids, and Salt Lake City is the preferred bidder. And off the top of my head, I can't remember if it's 2030 or 2034. I think it's 2030, the Winter Olympics. And as part of that, they're going to get a new arena. So that's why Salt Lake was coming into the league at some point. They wanted this owner, Ryan Smith, in the league, and they knew they were getting a new arena eventually. So they'll be in this one for a little bit, and then we'll see. As for Arizona, part of this, and this is one of the reasons that, look, there, there's two things here they've sold Alex Morello on. One, I think he's getting a billion dollars for his team, so he'll be made whole and then some. And number two, there's going to be an exclusive window, I believe for five years of him to put a new team in Arizona. Now it doesn't mean he can just sit around for five years and hold on to it. From what I understand, it's written in a certain way that there's certain benchmarks or things he has to accomplish or else he could lose it. But if he can go out and he can get a new building and he can get construction done and he hits those targets, he's going to have five years to bring the team back. So like the NHL is not abandoning Phoenix. They are going back or Arizona. They're going back to that market at some point. It's just a matter of how and who it's with. We're talking to Elliot Friedman from 32 thoughts, hockey night in Canada, talking to Arizona coyote. So Alex Morello, we just mentioned, uh, could be upwards of a billion dollars. He pays his debt. It's a nice chunk of change. But this guy yes. has not been able to convince anybody in Arizona uh, that, and he had ample time to get this thing done. Yeah. Why would the league still want to give him first rights of refusal? This, this guy does not have a great reputation. He didn't pay his bills, Elliot. Why Why do they yep. feel loyal to this guy to give him a first crack at another team? What did he have on the NHL that that, uh, that that they wouldn't open this up to a lot more billionaires out there? Nick, I don't think it's about what they owe him. I think it's more on what did he have. And I, and I don't think it's pictures of anyone, if that's what you're asking. Uh, I think it's... Uh, 
I think what it is is they wanted to get this done as smoothly as possible. Alex Morello was willing to fight them. He was willing to make this very difficult on them. He was willing to go to court. Um, that's who he is. He's he's going to fight you. That's his. Uh, that's you know that's what his. Uh, that's how he built his business. Not being a shrinking violent, not uh, violent, not being somebody who could be easily intimidated. He's a fighter, and the easiest way to get this done in terms of as quickly as possible and not get tied up in court or anything like that was to make sure a he was okay with the payout which he apparently is and b there is a level of him i understand that wants to prove that he can do this he doesn't like that people think that he can't do it even though there's good reason for that he doesn't like it and i think he wants the opportunity, at least the league feels he wants the opportunity to prove it. So that's what you have to do. You have to, like Nick, sometimes in the negotiation you have the hammer and sometimes you don't. And in this case, Marillo had a hammer. He could make this really difficult on the NHL. So he gets a bit of a better deal. Like The one thing I do think is I do think there are people in the league who think that he's getting away with too sweet a deal. But he had the ability to hold this up and make this difficult, and they didn't want that. I will say this too, Nick and Justin. I, it's, it's really obvious to me that there's an anger. I mean, you can see it on social media from the Coyotes fans. Like, like People didn't want to talk last night. You know, to be honest, Nick, when I went down to the dressing room after the game, I didn't even want to stand near anyone from Arizona because I don't want anyone to think, like, these people are giving me information. But... Like, you can just see how how mad some people are. They're concerned about, you know, the staff members, and their jobs. I mean, you know much how much the, the, the trainers, the equipment staff, all those people who work so hard, they're not as protected as the players and coaches. You know, how this, how this is going to affect families. Like, they're angry. And there's a certain feeling of, and I think it's a very fair feeling, that it's not acceptable to stand out there and say, okay, we're going to get this auction done and we're going to build a new arena and we're going to save hockey in, in Arizona. And then when this story breaks, suddenly you don't say anything. Like the, like the people yeah, there yesterday, you know, I, I tried to ask, have you guys heard anything? And I, I didn't get the impression that anybody did. And so you can't do that. You have to – I think that's where the real oh, anger played, internally Elliot. is. They all got is, played. Is, yeah. They all got played. You're right. They all got played. And they're mad about it. So, you know, so much of this feels like it's driven by frustration. They can't get it done, impatience. But the whole mullet arena thing and the way players were feeling about this, I can't help but wonder about Marty Walsh, who, you know, came in and really made strong statements about how this just can't continue. He seemed to be a good advocate for the players. How much of this is driven by the players and Marty Walsh saying we're just sick of whatever this temp situation is. I don't think it it hurt, and and, and I and I think you're right about one thing, Justin. I definitely feel the players believe that Walsh was a good advocate for them. Like you know, he made his feelings heard. He said his piece, um, but there wasn't really much they could do. And even now, the players are saying. Hey, you know, what are my rights? And they're being told not a lot, really. You know, their their contracts are going to be purchased as part of the sale. Now, it's going to be interesting to see if some players say they want to be traded or they give Smith a chance to speak to them. We'll see where that goes. But really, this came down to, from a business point of view, it couldn't continue. Like, it just couldn't continue this way. And that's why I think that... Um, that's why I think that it, while it helped what Walsh did and the players appreciate what Walsh did, it, it became more about this mullet situation becoming untenable. From a, from a revenue point of view, big picture, 100% yep. the right move. Yeah. That's it. But is this, if you're, if you're Ryan Walsh, do you, or sorry, Ryan Smith, do you, do you, want this to happen this way with no lead up in branding, no ability to get the rink set up the way you want it. Like the amount of money he's going to spend for this. Is this the right way? Will he be happy with how this is happening? Listen, it's an exclusive group. There's only 32 of these things. You take them when you can get them. Is that it? 100%. Well, I, 
I think I think he would have preferred an expansion team. Um, he's on record as saying that he would have preferred it, but they they wanted him in the league too. You know, I remember a few years ago when we reported that Walsh had first met with Batman. You know, Nick is in particular. You've done the job that I do. There are times that people want things out there, and. I just remember the way that Walsh came across at the time. There were people who wanted everyone to know that this guy was interested in the NHL and the NHL was interested in him, and this is a good thing. You know, he's seen as a very good owner in NBA circles. He's a very smart guy. He really wanted the NHL. People wanted him in the league. And, you know, I I think it just came down to... He wants it. They wanted it. Would he have preferred to do an expansion team? Yes. But there was a problem they needed to solve, and he could solve it. And it, it became, like, he's. I think he's very happy. I think he's very eager. I think he's happy to prove what he can do. But it is no question that right now he was the right guy in the right place at the right time, and people wanted him in the league. I, I I agree with you, Elliot. That uh, like Arizona is very much on the plans for for the future here, and I would say yep. three to five years we will hear hockey going back there. I'm with you. You know, it's for one thing, players like playing there. Um, they love living in Arizona. Yeah, it's a great you. place to live. Um, you know, number two, they've got they've got a minor hockey program that is turning out Hall of Fame level players, and that's important. It's a big TV market. Um, They'll go back. I'm with you. And, uh, you know, I don't think that, I don't believe that there was ever anything serious, if anything at all, with Matt Ishbia, who's the current owner of the Suns, but I find it hard to believe that at some point after this is all over, um, there isn't going to be a conversation with him if, assuming Morello can't pull this off, there isn't going to be a conversation with him about, okay, how do we get all in bed together here? How do we turn this into a big Polly Morris or whatever they call it relationship? Uh, so then Houston and Atlanta, and we're just going to have 100 teams? We're good with 100 teams? No, no, no. We're going to have 100 teams all <laughs> south of the border. Yeah. Like if I'm a Canadian right now and I'm watching Utah over anything in Canada that we have to offer, I think it's kind of a sad day for Canadians too. It, it is, Nick, but it is. And, and like as a guy who grew up watching the Nordiques and uh, Canadians and would love to see that again, um, I like my question is: Can it really work in, with two teams in the province of Quebec? And I, I would love to have someone prove me wrong. I, I just, that's what I think the issue is. Do they really think it can work in the soon to be a hundred million dollar salary cap NHL? That's my question. And I hope someone can prove the doubters wrong. But you know, the other thing too is, and I've, I've said this a lot. The NFL has 32 teams in the U.S. The NBA has, what is it, 31 in the U.S. Major League Baseball is, is 29 and 1. The NHL is 25 and 7. And the NHL believes there's room for more, and that's why you're going to see it. I, I, Justin, I don't know what number we're going to go to here. If it's going to be 34. Um, I know there's some people predicting it's going to be 36. Elliot, there's not enough I'm good players. Con- yeah, I'm not convinced of that yet, but I can see 34. I can. I think that's. I don't think that's out of the question. Yeah, I don't disagree. And regardless, if you think there's a, enough talent to produce top-rated God, pro hockey players, I don't think it matters to them. I was too late, Kip. I missed my window. Yeah, you did, buddy. Oh, well. You did. All right, <laughs> Elliot, we're going to let you go. We'll see you a little later on tonight on our telecast, Sportsnet Ontario, Leafs and Devils, along with the very talented and muscular David Amber. <laughs> <laughs> the steroid-aided David Amber. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you can't put that out publicly. <laughs> Why do you think he has so much energy? All right. Thanks, Elliot. <laughs> 
Thanks, See you Friedman. guys. Speak to you soon. Elliot Friedman. So, listen. Spent the majority of my broadcasting career, like, thinking about the players, supporting the players, players' rights and all of that. Yeah. You know, I, I get, I get how difficult this could be for some of the players. But if you recently bought a home there or got a golf membership lately there, yeah. you're dumb. You're just, that was a dumb I, decision. I see your point. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want to hear. You're not saying in general if you do that, you're dumb. You're saying it's Arizona. Have you not been aware of the circumstances around the team? 100%. You're playing in a building that looks like something from, like, that would be men's league top performance. Yeah. Would come out of that building. Yeah. Where would you have joined Arizona and thinking I'm going to buy a home here? And and if they buy a home, you can sell it. Same market. So I don't want to hear that. Yeah. I don't want to hear a player say, I just bought a home there. Yeah. Like, I got no tears for you. Okay? This team should have been moved 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and they're not, you know, I know it's not the point necessarily, but they're not moving you to nowheresville. Salt Lake City in the winter is sunny and beautiful, and it's a lovely place to live. They got hockey. It's going to be a great hockey your, town. Your team got traded to Utah. You got dealt. Just. But hey, I am curious it's to know. It's a guaranteed contract. Like, what happens with no trade co- clauses? Because a lot of players would have had Arizona on their list. Who maybe they you didn't get traded. Maybe they played in Salt Lake, you though. You didn't get traded. I know, but I'm saying other people have Arizona on their no trade list. Maybe yeah. they play in Salt Lake City. You know, maybe guys will. I think they'd probably honor. Chance to revisit. I think a, they'd honor that part. Yeah. That's not that hard of a decision. Figure I out think. some of that stuff. You know, but. The like, Salt Lake. It, it's the right decision for the league. At it the is the right end decision. of when it's all said and done. Let's be honest. This should have been done two years ago. You're going to play this in has front been of embarrassing. 15,000 people. There's mountains there, skiing, golf, and you can golf okay. year round. You're good. I, uh, you'll, you'll be just fine. Maybe not year round. I, uh, I have felt, you know, they're the Lenny and the Simpsons don't let them see how I live or, you know, don't tell people how I live sort of thing. I felt like that about Mullet Arena. Like, don't let NFL fans see our, that one of our teams plays here. Like, oh, mm-hmm. it's not, uh, not been a point of pride. We should do, you want to do game time? Let her rip. Okay, you are going to have Yele do, uh, do game time. Let's go. It's game time presented by Bet365. Visit oh, the app for cool. the latest odds and find out why it's never ordinary. I bet 365 must be 19 plus Ontario only play responsibly. All right. It's game time. Er- oh, I love it. Thanks. Yes, there. <laughs> great intro by Disco. <laughs> <laughs> 10 games in the National Hockey League tonight. Um, all right. I had a few that stood out and just kind of scoping up through the different lines and what's going on. Um, I'm going to be a homer and I'm going to take the Leafs. I-, I do like the Leafs minus one and a half here against the Devils. I think Matthews is hunting. They're chasing 70. They're motivated and eager to try and get it. He's had a ton of success against them, as you pointed out, Borny, earlier in the show. Plus 125, minus one and a half. I like the Toronto Maple Leafs there. That would be the first time someone has ever picked Leafs minus one and a half on this show. Sam, really? He doesn't have the, he, he's afraid of jinxing it okay. sort of thing. Well, so. I get that. He's a, he's a true hardcore fan right. at heart. I get that. And Matthews, by the way, to have... Two goals or more in this game, plus 325. Not a ton of juice for, I mean, essentially banking for two goals. That's, yeah, but interesting. You know he's hunting for it. Could get four. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're the books. You're like, move that number down a bit. You remember, it's funny, because we looked at that shot total from the last, I think it was 11, 12 games, whatever, and he's got 62. Yeah, it's absurd uh, number. Last 11 games, 62 shots he has. He's averaging about six. Six shots a game. Uh, the other game I was looking at, Capitals on the road at Buffalo. Really mm-hmm. like Washington in this spot. I don't know. Ovi's just, he's he's hitting other gear. He's getting, he's been hot, staying hot. He got 30, mm-hmm. man. It's crazy. Think about where he was in November, December, mm-hmm. and he's at 30 now on the season. 14 goals in the last 20 games. I just think that they've got, they're playing for something. There's stakes there for them. And they're dogs. I, I like them to win on the road. And my last one that I wanted to circle, Lightning. Tampa at home they've won six of their last eight vasilevsky started to look like the old vasilevsky i like the form that he's shown in the last month or so uh tampa at home uh they are playing just to confirm uh ottawa Mm -hmm. tampa at home against ottawa uh those are the three that i sort of circled on the board tonight for game time 
And that, of course, was brought to you by Brett365. Thank you, sir. And just a reminder, that. though, that uh, this hour of Real Kipper and Born is brought to you by Bet365, as always. Yes, All sir. Right. All right. What do you got? Break? Break. We go to break? We got so much stuff to get. It's tons. Tons. Including a crazy <laughs> Western Conference that got a little crazier with the Oilers' 5-1 victory over Vegas and the Canucks take one on the chin against Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City uh Coyotes? That sounds so wrong. <laughs> it's too many words. Just so bad. So what does that mean? Right? Uh, yeah. What does that mean? We're going to figure it all out when we return to Real Kipper and Bourne. Nick Kipper, Justin Bourne, Disco Dan. All right, Western Conference. All we got was more confused last night. Well said. But I will say this. As far as looking at the Oilers win last night over Vegas, above all standings or no standings, a convincing win without Connor McDavid. Mm -hmm. I got to think there's more confidence right now in that room just for that very reason than maybe anything we've seen all season long out of the Oilers. Yeah, you think of them, I would say, as much as any team, that boy, you know, they rely on this one guy to drive everything and to have Vegas come in and just get worked over the way they did was, yeah, I would say somewhat heartening for, for Oilers fans to see that there's some more juice past the top guy there. Now. Now, um, we look at Vegas. Vegas. Like, not a great time to get cold here. Ice cold. There is still a lot of meat in the bone here to finish their season off. Uh they lost three in a row. Yeah, and you know the fairly good teams, the Coyotes, Salt Lake City Coyotes, beat them once too. But like they're giving life, they're they're giving some life, have they not? To the St. Louis Blues, well, the Blues, yeah, the Blues could get to ninety five points. Vegas is sitting on ninety two with four games left. So yeah, I mean, they, maybe there's a shred of hope there. Vegas does have to play Colorado, Minnesota. So you know, maybe they'll lose a couple. The other thing that kind of stands out for me watching the Oilers get ready for the playoffs is how good is Ekholm. Mm-hmm. And like, he almost I, killed that I, poor think, goalie yesterday. I think there's an appreciation for him. There's no question league-wide. But he's, for me, is I'm looking at him in a much different light than I saw in Nashville, where he's, for me, he's almost got... Zdeno Chara presence for the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, see, because yes. Chara would fight you, right? And the other day we saw that Ekholm's not doing that. Well, yeah, listen, I mean, is the game's changed enough yeah. where I think he's big enough, strong enough. Yeah, he can hit. He's competitive. He, he, like, there's enough of a, a streak in him that mm. you better keep your head up against him. No, he cannot scare you that, physically yeah. that way, like Chara. But I think he has that presence for me on the blue line that this is the guy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be interesting because, you know, I've said this for a long time, but Edmonton's chase of Vancouver is as real as ever with Vancouver giving up a point last night. Oilers four points back with two games in hand. So obviously they can catch them. They also play Vancouver a couple days from now on Hockey Night in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And that's for... Win in the division. Essentially. You know, if Edmonton were to win that and to narrow that gap to two points and then also have two games in hand, including games, two games against Arizona and one against San Jose, you got to believe Edmonton's walking away with it at that point. Mm-hmm. So H and I see Saturday night, Edmonton has a chance to say the division after all this long slog is ours. What's crazy to me is, Who are they going to play in round one? Right now, if season ends today, they play Los Angeles. If they catch Vancouver, it could be Nashville. It could be Vegas. They could stay where they are. It could be Vegas. They could play any number of teams right now. There's just nothing decided. And I get as well that no Petrangelo last night, and they've got uh, Mark Stone. We don't really know for sure whether or not he's got a chance to. Is his spleen better? Right. I don't know. Your guess is leans heal I've quickly. Heard, I've not heard magically show up for rehab? game one. Magically, have that would be possible. But 
even if there's no guarantee once you get these guys back that you can just find your your mojo mm -hmm. still. Uh, Hill didn't look that great, especially on the wraparound goal on, of Holloway's. It's like, who's your goalie, Thompson? Yeah. Like Hill won the Stanley Cup, but I, I don't. I think there's people still questioning who's your goalie in it's Vegas. Big questions. I mean, you got you know one of the best decors in the NHL, if not the best. So you think you can insulate either guy pretty well, but. Yeah, Vegas has got to sort it out. I still say, though, you don't want to play him in playoffs. You don't want Hurdle to start getting, you know, find his stride. You don't want Stone to come back. You don't want Hannafin to be at his best and Petrangelo to come back. It, it could all come together in a scary way still. So, yeah, lots to be determined on, on where Vegas ends up. It's certainly a little concerning that they're not winning more games than they are. Of all the big contenders, or paraphrase, contenders, mm -hmm. are they the one that maybe doesn't concern you or will give... It gives you the least amount of pause because we've seen them yeah. do it. I, I would say it's like, very I think that's much part like of Tampa it, right? Bay for me. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah. this team might come in a wild card spot. They don't care. I mean, they're still Tampa Bay. They still have great players. They can still beat you any night. Well coached. So, yeah, I think that's a reasonable way to look at it. As far as one of ten games tonight, mm -hmm. Detroit and Pittsburgh, that comes on the news that, Andrew Kopp has been uh, diagnosed with a broken cheekbone and will not play that's against Pittsburgh. for them, man. Like, that's a, that's your typical Game 7 type of player. Yeah. Like, that that one stings. Detroit-Pittsburgh is monstrous tonight. Just a monstrous game. Both teams one point behind the Washington Capitals uh, for that final playoff spot, and both with four games remaining. It is, you lose tonight and you're done. Seasons on the line and no cops. So that is a big one. Islanders have kind of pulled themselves out of the fight, Kippy. NHL playoff odds via money puck have the Islanders with an 83.6% chance of making it. Patrick Wah. Patty Wah. Can we uh, not, not give him a ton of credit here? I'll give him credit for a couple things. Underlying numbers did change when he came in. Their defensive metrics got better. That's a, a tangible change that they saw. The other thing is that when they almost peed down their leg and let the season get away from him with a couple of losses, he didn't go in front of the microphone and act like John Tortorella and say, these guys don't know what it takes to win. They, they don't, they got to play different now. I'm going to sit my captain down. He just said, I actually liked our game tonight. And I think that let them kind of stay in the fight a little bit and still believe. All right. We got some sound also um, for him. Peter Laviolette, who had a very big issue with the New York Islanders <laughs> on Dobson and his collision with Zabanajad. Can I weigh in on this before we hear the coach? You can. But it was Adam Pellick. There was two. Oh, it was Adam it was Pellick, Pellick, sorry. Pellick Zibanejad, Zibanejad, Dobson, Dobson on Troch. Correct. Okay, that's the one I'm thinking of. Just a quick reminder as well that the, this segment of Real Kipper and Born brought to you by Hyundai. All right, let's go. We're up to, to Laviolette. You want to go to him yeah, first? let's go to yeah, Peter let's Laviolette. Laviolette. He came back at the end from that vicious hit, yeah. He yeah. came back. Vicious. That vicious shoulder elbow to the head. Watch it. Sorry, you, you think it was intentional and it wasn't I a do. collision? I do. What about the cops in here? Vicious from behind. Both. All right, let's pick it up with Patrick Waugh's reaction to vicious. Patrick, Peter Levillet just said that he felt the the collision between Pellick and Zabanajad was an intentional... Accidental, you're right. <laughs> but he said intentional by Pellick. No, it was accidental. The referee was in a really good position to see it. He saw it. There is, I was more afraid that Pellick might get hurt on that one. I mean, he's the one that hit Pellick. I mean, he was, it was the opposite, I think, that, that what happened. I mean, it been the same thing happened in Pittsburgh with the referee. So, I mean, it was totally accidental. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean... And I think Kelly was was in a really good position to see everything, and he made it clear right away that it was accidental. So, but sometimes frustration make you say things. <laughs> sometimes frustration make you say things. It's I true. think we're all leaning towards Patrick Waugh on this, buddy. It was absolutely accidental. You know, like mm -hmm. if one guy did run into one guy, you fine, make the case that it's Zabanajad. But yeah, both guys are looking somewhere totally different. It's not at all in the history of. The Islanders defenseman, Pellick, and I know people are like, Islanders homer, watch the head. He doesn't <laughs> see him coming. Yeah. He's looking. 
completely the yeah, other way. Guy yeah, runs into his shoulder. If and... anything, honestly, the second one is more egregious. Oh, it's like way, that's way, way worse. worse. It's brutal. We are closing in on like silly season where like there's going to be accusations. I love that this. Two really competitive just coaches. Doesn't look remotely with what we saw yet. The posturing now from here on end between coaches and referees or the league. This is this is when it gets interesting. This is where these guys think that they also have to make their money. These oh, head coaches. Oh yeah, they're working the media. There, I mean, this is really good. I loved Wa interrupting the question. Uh, Laviolette said he thought that it was accidental. Is it accidental? <laughs> accidental. I'm told you're right. Yeah, accidental. You're right. Yeah. Um, but you know, we've talked for years about the way the coaches try to portray their teams as the underdog or uh, being wronged by the refs. They're trying to push everything in their favor. Um, but that was a big, big game. I mean, big game for the Islanders who, you know, now up to 87 points, probably under the Carolina Hurricanes, which isn't great. But, you know, they've got Montreal tonight and can really, you know, get to 91 points and they probably got it. Four points away. All right. Uh, we want to get into the NHLPA players poll as well. But before we get into that, did you guys catch Joel Quenville at all? Uh, mm-hmm. He appeared on the Cam and Strick podcast where he... he spoke candidly about the handling of the Kyle Beach situation. Did you catch any of it at all, JB? No, I didn't, but I have read quotes. Disco, how about you? Saw, saw a little bit of it, uh, gave it a brief listen, um, didn't listen to it in its entirety. It's interesting. Like, he he tries to show that he's culpable. Like, he, he understands the culpability that he bears for his role yeah. and his presence there during that time, but yet he sort of pleads ignorance when it comes to knowing all the particulars or tries to distance himself enough to say, well, I knew, but I didn't really know. Yeah. And I think that's where then you got to ask yourself, okay, well, what's genuine and what's not? How much of what he's telling us is truthful versus is he is he sort of spinning a narrative here because he wants to get back into the league? I think that's where it's, it's tricky, and it's going to be sort of discretionary depending on who you yeah. ask for their opinion. And you're, you're bang on because that's... I, I did listen to it, and I just wondered. I, I don't know what Joel was trying to accomplish through it, because, like you, Disco, I'm like I got more questions mm-hmm. that you. You try to pick and choose which ones you wanted to say and which ones you didn't, and on a number of occasions, it's like I, I don't want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, then, and we're all here to guess yeah. what happened, and that's all we've been left with since they closed this investigation is we we we, we really know jack squat here still yeah. and and you are telling me you want to pick and choose what you want to say and what you don't want to say and all you've done is just leave us as confused as ever and to your point if it's just all about trying to rehabilitate your image or get back in you you, you got to come a little bit more truthful than that i think I don't think he. I don't think Joel did himself any favors. No, I think I understand the like desire that like if you don't get out there and talk and be you know front facing, yeah. you're never. It's not going to happen. They're not going to pull you out of the yeah. shadows and say now you're allowed back. So I get the attempt to kind of be out there again. Um, but you're right that there needs to be some sort of airing of what's gone on here, and it'll probably stir up some bad emotions and have people won't like it. But at least you start down the path of healing in some way right now it's still a lot of questions so there was one answer in particular and i don't he was sort of sharing an anecdote but then it sort of morphed into just kind of him imparting his view of what the front office was at that time and he referred to them as the firm the firm is what he called them and and i don't i feel like that was sort of by design of trying to say hey see i was just as much out of the loop. an outsider. I Exactly. Yeah. Like, I was an outcast, and I didn't have my fingerprints on in the way that people might assume I did. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was an interesting point that he made. Sort of went out of his way. It morphed from a story into him just talking about how, yeah, they were the... F- I, we all used to call them the firm because they did their own thing. And I think that sort of paints enough of a picture as to some of the motivation behind him appearing and talking. So you, you took the hit, right? You took the hit for the firm, yeah. which doesn't help, right, moving forward. I don't think that's part of the healing process. That just mm-hmm. revisits a lot of unanswered questions. 
which yeah. again, I don't think helps him. Nope. Anyways, all right. All right let's move on. Uh, Connor McDavid, Sidney Crosby, the uh, the big winners, I guess, in the NHL players poll, which we kind of like because this is your peers. This yeah. is not. You know, a bunch of writers who go to bed early like they do when they vote for the awards. But, hey, there's significant information in here. If you want to need to win one game, who's the forward you want on your team? They still have Crosby second. Like, it's McDavid one. Crosby's still second among NHL players who almost 12% of guys say, give me Sid, one game. Guy's 36. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? I kind of get wanting the fastest most talented player i guess i mean there's so many factors into wanting a guy for game seven nathan mckinnon i i, I know i know it doesn't get enough love man. but i don't think there's a higher compliment than the most complete player in the league still is they said Sid. a guy in his late 30s they said he's the most yes. complete player in the league number two is interesting it's barkov and i think i know on your guys' show He's universally loved yeah. because Bukola comes on all the time and talks about how great he is and he doesn't get enough respect. And, yeah. and he's right up there as one of the most complete two-way players in the game. I think it's interesting that he's second. Like it, I think it's interesting that Austin Matthews isn't on the list. 100%. For a guy who, you know, I think you got some stats on here I for did. Matthews. So what do you have on Matthews? Is okay, so off the top of my head, I'm just going to pull it up because I had it, I had it in here as well. Okay, here's, here's Austin Matthews. Austin Matthews third in the NHL among forwards in take in uh, takeaways, third in the NHL among forwards in block shots as well, and then he was fifth in on ice uh, goal differential with him on the he's ice. He's always a top faceoff guy too. So funny he's not in the top five. Some some Leafs resentment in here. You think? <laughs> yep. uh, no, Leafs I, always I, get a bunch. To of me, games. to me, Austin's still not a top. Selkie type of guy, right? But I mean, it's hard to imagine on the list. talking about scoring 70 goals and being one of the yeah. best defensive forwards. You just kind of, you, you kind of push on scoring goals above, yeah. above, above defensive responsibilities. Yeah. But the numbers, I'll, I'll tell you what, if Austin really, really wants to change that narrative for next year, beat Barkov in the first round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100%. There you go. Yeah. McDav uh, that list is Crosby, Barkov, Kopitar, McDavid, McKinnon for uh, yeah, complete players. Yeah, and tell you what, that Kopitar is doing everything he can to carry the L.A. Kings as well. No kidding. You know, there's uh, still plenty of juice in that guy. Yeah, okay, we got best playmaker. Oh, we got to go. <laughs> we're, we're on we're, TV. We're, give me one more. Okay, uh, who do you least enjoy playing against but would like to have in your team? Marchand. Uh, Marchand? Yeah. Where's Bennett? Not, Not on, on their list. Good, Good shot. Tom Wilson. Third. Good shot. Good pick. Yeah. Hunter McDavis, number two there. I guess I could really? play. Don't well, enjoy playing him. Embarrass you. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and Petriangelo <laughs> going, oh boy, as he comes down the neutral. All right, neutral. our thanks to Joshua Cloak, who joined us in the first hour, and then Elliot Friedman on the latest. Thanks to Marty Walsh, to Ryan Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Good riddance yeah. to Arizona. See you soon. This isn't goodbye. It's see you later. That's the expression on it. All right. Uh, Hyundai. Free. Oh, yes. This hour, this segment brought to you by Hyundai. Uh, I don't know. We're too late. <laughs> I'll catch you tomorrow. I'll make it up to them. We'll make it up to them. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Enjoy the games.